mind laughing. Hey, you guys, it's Mr. Reardon. It is, what day is it? Monday. Monday, February 2nd, and I'm here with Zach and Kermit and Justin, the brave trio who is not at the French convention, and we haven't been in school in about a week. And so my goal for you guys is to catch you up on a couple of things that we should have done in class last week, numero uno being learning about operons and learning about, really, to be perfectly honest, why it is that some of these bacteria glowed green and others did not. So you got to kind of do a little mental rewind to about a week and a half ago and remember that some of our transformed bacteria looked pale yellow, while some of them, when it worked well, had this beautiful green glow. And the reason they had that beautiful green glow is because of a genetic construct called an operon. Uh, what I want to do in this brief video is talk about, again, why these things glow green and then what the heck operons are. And that will lead us into another screencast on other ways that uh, bacteria control genetic expression as well as gene diversity. But before we get too deep into it, I want to walk you through the screencast that I put together for this broadcast that will be on our blog. Ultimately, here we are in the introduction. I want to talk about why some of these bacteria glow green. We want to learn uh, how operons work, and then we want to learn why bacteria have operons. So in about 12 minutes from now, we should be into a little T-chart looking at two different types of operons that bacteria have. Along the way, we need to go back and look at the pigloplasmid, remember what genes were on the plasmid that we inserted into the bacteria. We need to relate the ARA gene to operons, because that's a big kind of disconnect that we need to fix. And then I want to talk about how operons work. And we'll do that by playing with one of my favorite toys, Lego models. So be ready for that. And if you've got Legos at home, feel free to use them. Then you're probably going to get lost for a moment. You're going to say, well, how do operons relate to green glowing bacteria? We're going to figure that out. And then last but certainly not least, I want to talk about why bacteria have operons anyway. That's the plan. So let's go back to the top. Let's remember why these things can glow green anyway. Why, why is it that these transformed E. coli can glow green? And there's a simple reason for that. We inserted a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid that's been commercially called the P-glow plasmid. P stands for plasmid, and glow is kind of cute because these bacteria glow green. Like any good plasmid, this circular piece of DNA has an origin of replication. That's the ORI. It's got an amp It's got a antibiotic resistance gene. This one here is called BLA for beta-lactamase. Remember that all the transformed bacteria had the ability to grow in the presence of ampicillin. Reason being is that they could express this BLA gene or beta-lactamase gene, make beta-lactamase secrete it outside their cells, break down ampicillin, and survive where non-transformed bacteria could. What's equally cool are these other two genes which we haven't talked about at all. Now, the GFP gene, that's pretty straightforward. It's a green fluorescent protein. And the bacteria you see here on my right, perhaps your left, are glowing green because they're expressing that green fluorescent protein. They're expressing the gene. So this gene was transcribed into messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA was then translated into a, a green fluorescent protein. What's cool is this other gene, ARAC. Now, ARAC is a... It's a regulatory gene, and it codes for a regulatory protein that can only be induced by the presence of arabinose, that is a sugar. So here's the scoop. ARAC, this gene right here, the one that's shown in red, actually controls the expression of GFP. So we have one gene controlling the expression of another. This is a very simple model but it's beautiful because it gets you into understanding and the basics of gene expression. And worth noting that, you know, you've got 25 or 30,000 genes in every one of your cells. Most of them are turned off, okay? Otherwise, we'd express all our proteins at once. There'd be chaos and we wouldn't survive. Uh, that very complex scenario can be modeled here in bacteria by thinking about how one gene controls the expression of another. Simple story. But again, it's got profound implications in terms of uh, understanding how molecular genetics works. Now, to understand, to understand uh, what that ARAC gene is, we've got to understand an operon. And an operon, my friends, is 
a sequence of regulatory gene. I'm sorry, it's a sequence of genes found in bacteria that are regulated by an operator. Okay, a sequence of genes that work together and they're they're under the control of an operator. Now, what do I really mean by that? I'm going to skip down to a bit more uh, interesting model right here. Here is a typical picture of an operon. This is called the trip operon. It actually codes for this is a series of genes, one, two, three, and four. These four genes work together. Actually, it looks like there's going to be five of them. These five genes work together to code for an enzymatic pathway that makes the amino acid tryptophan. So uh, without getting too into it, an, an operon consists of genes that code for proteins that work together. And they're all under the control of a promoter. And then that promoter has a specific subset called the operator. And I think that's where people kind of get confused. So this is a bit more complex diagram. Once the beach ball stops spinning, I want to go back to our more simple diagram. So imagine here this LAC Z, this light blue gene, that's going to be the first of many genes that work together in the operon. And here we're taking an up close look at the promoter and the operator. Now here's what's important about the promoter. The promoter is a sequence of DNA. And the reason a promoter is important because it's a place where RNA polymerase can bind. I'm going to jump over to my Lego model and try and explain this a little bit more clearly. Zach, you want to take care of that bend? Get us to 88 degrees. All right, if things are working well, all of you guys can see this Lego model. And this Lego model, and, and Kermit and Justin also have Lego models, is supposed to be a typical operon. These three bricks, the green one, the yellow one, and the red one, represent the, the structural genes, the genes which are going to work together to code for proteins that also work together in a metabolic pathway. And then this blue area right here, that's supposed to represent the promoter. And you'll notice the promoter's all blue, but it's got a subset of dark green. That's the operator. Why is the promoter important? It's important because RNA polymerase, represented by this golden dome with wheels, RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, and once it sticks there, it's free to move downstream in transcribing the genes of the operon. Once those genes are transcribed, they'll get translated into polypeptides, and those polypeptides will work together to execute a metabolic pathway. Well, what's the deal? How does this relate to ARAC? Well, ARAC is this red brick right here. This is a regulatory gene, all right? It's a regulatory gene that codes for a regulatory protein. In this case, it's the headless policeman is our regulatory protein. So this is a gene, codes for it gets transcribed into a regulatory protein. And then that regulatory protein, this is important, that regulatory protein comes and sits on the operator, essentially blocking the movement of RNA polymerase and effectively shutting these genes down. Well, here's one of the so what's. What do these genes code for? In our lab, these genes of the operon code for the breakdown of arabinose. So you've got three genes that work in concert to take arabinose, a sugar, and break it down into something that the cells can use, ultimately ATP. That's the deal. And the thing is, why make the genes to break down arabinose if arabinose isn't present? Does that make sense? In our simple little Lego model, this is kind of goofy, but just stick with me. These three Legos work together to make police cars. So I've got a little police car here. Now, again, using the model, why would you make police cars for headless policemen? They can't even see the car, nor could they drive. So in our model, the policeman's head is the Arabinos. It's going to induce the expression of these genes. So watch, watch this. The head comes into the system. It connects to the regulatory protein. The regulatory protein is like, hey, I've got a head. This is awesome. Sweet. Oh, man, I got to go do something. The genes are turned on. RNA polymerase transcribes these three genes into RNA, uh, mRNA. That mRNA gets translated into police cars. And now the policeman's like, sweet. I got a car. I'm out of here. Let's go do some good, right? No. Apparently, it's a stand-up car. So off the policeman goes. And now these genes are free for transcription. Until 
the policeman getting so excited about his car crashes his car or he gets his head chopped off. I know the model's kind of falling apart. Head goes away. Oh, I got it. 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 All right. Policeman goes to the scene of the crime. Unfortunately, the crime is being perpetuated by samurai swordsmen who chop off his head. He falls off his car, binds back to his former spot on the operator, no more cars, because you don't need cars if you don't have heads. Right. I know it's, a, it's not perfect, but it's the best I can do. And the reason I bring that up is because I think that Legos make for good models, and they kind of get your hands next to playing with these jeans. And to be perfectly honest, the images in your text look a whole lot like Legos. Now, how does this relate to the Piglo gene? Again, I'll, I'll say it briefly, and I think it makes really good sense. These bacteria won't glow green unless they have a reason to glow green, unless there's a ravenose present. Uh, essentially, what's happened is the guys that design and gals that design this system know that they can induce or turn on certain genes by adding the substrate that those genes are going to break down. And again, does that make sense, gentlemen? Cool. So, no reason to make, no re and here's another model of it. No need to make the three genes that c work together to break down arabinose unless arabinose here, indicated by the red dot, is present in the system. You buy it? Now what's cool, this is a really simple, simple uh, model, but what the guys did at Edvotech is they know how the ARA operon works. So what they've done is they've spliced out the three genes which code for arabinose, and they've spliced in the green fluorescent protein gene. And I'm going to show that to you right here. So essentially, you can build a construct where you remove these three genes. And using, uh, and that's using a molecule called a restriction enzyme, which we'll talk about next week. And then they spliced in using ligase the green fluorescent protein. The only thing that's changed is the genes downstream from the, op from the promoter and the operator. Promoter's still here, the operator's still here, the regulatory gene is still here, that's your ARAC, and your inducer, the policeman's head, is still here. So, add policeman's head. Sweet, man, I can see again, right? Policeman hops off the operator and goes looking for his car. There's no cars because there's no genes for cars. What there is is green, green fluorescent protein. RNA polymerase cruises down, transcribes GFP into mRNA, and that mRNA is then translated into... GFP and you get you get the glow. Super cool. I think it's cool. And the reason it works is because the folks that design the lab know how operons work. And essentially what's really cool is they've taken a, a classic effector or inducer, this arabinose, and they've used it to not get arabinose metabolizing genes, but the expression of green fluorescent protein. I think it's really, really cool. Now, I think we've looked at the basics of that model. Let's look again just one time to, to uh, review. And then I want to talk about two different types of operons. A good operon has structural genes. It's got a promoter, a place for RNA polymerase to bind. It's got an operator, a place for a regulatory protein to bind. In this case, it'll be the antenna because I lost my policeman. Okay. And then it's got a regulatory gene which codes for the regulator. Pretty slick. And again, you can see this in your text. This Lego model is the same thing as this. Now, again, I wanted to talk about why do bacteria have operons anyway? Why operons anyway? And there's really two things you need to know. Let me blow this up just a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and cut to the chase. The reason that operons are included in the bacterial genome is because it's all about conservation of energy. All right, so this is a T-chart that or a matrix that is on your presentation for uh, chapter 18 
microbial genetics. We did this in class. Zach's class did this the other day. But what we do is we, break, we can break down operons into two different types, inducible and repressible. And you'll see these here as two different legs of this, uh, two different legs of this uh, mind map. Bottom line is, again, I said it once, I'll say it twice, it's important. It's all about energy conservation. We met that inducible operon earlier, right? The, the operon that coded for the genes which break down arabinose, they're shut off unless arabinose is present. The idea being, why would you ever synthesize enzymes for a substrate that's not there? Does that make sense? Shut it down. Don't make those proteins unless you need them. Don't make police cars unless you've got policemen with heads that can actually drive them. Or don't make, don't make three genes that break down arabinose if there's no arabinose. And the fancy word for that is inducible. We induce those operons to turn on. In general, inducible operons code for catabolic pathways, those pathways which break down substrates or break down polymers into simpler compounds. And the question we're trying to answer is, why would you make enzymes for substrates that don't exist? Now, you guys are smart. The opposite of inducible is repressible. The opposite of catabolic is, say it with me, Anabolic. absolutely. And the idea would be, why would, so the question becomes, you, an, well, we know that anabolic pathways make things, right? So you're going to make a substance until what? Think about that for a second. You have enough of it. That's absolutely right. And once you have enough of it, you then stop, stop making it. You shut down that operon. That's an example of what, gentlemen? Negative Very good. It's a negative feedback system. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. So you'll make a, you'll make a substance until its concentration builds up or until it comes from an outside source. And that gets us back to that tryptophan operon that I mentioned uh, just oh so briefly. The trip operon codes for the amino acid tryptophan. These bacteria have to make it unless it comes from outside the cell. And the classic example is we all eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Turkey is loaded with tryptophan. The E. coli in our large intestine uh, get bathed in tryptophan, and they, that tryptophan leaches into those cells or diffuses into those cells, and then ultimately shuts down this trip operon, because why would you make something when you've got plenty of it? You know? If I had to, I could make clothes, but I don't have to because they're at the store. Correct? That's kind of the deal. Uh, and again, so the repre so in closing, operons are a function. They're really a way for bacteria to turn off and turn on genes that they need or don't need. See?